Our next contribution is from Jane MacArthur of the University of Leicester, and the title of her talk is The First Regolith Brescia Meteorite from Mars. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak here today about my PhD research at the University of Leicester, um, where my supervisors, John Bridges, Mike Branny, Steve Baker, and postdoc Leon Hicks have given me a lot of support. Um, and Katie Joy, Ray Burgess at the University of Manchester have done some argon dating work with us, and Natasha Stephen at Plymouth did a lovely microprobe map of one of our sections. So the first regolith breccia meteorite from Mars was discovered in 2011 and first characterised in a paper by Carla G at the University of New Mexico in 2012. And it's the first of its type. It's different to all the other meteorites that came before it because it's more representative of the surface material. And it's thought to have been formed in an impact event. So one impact fused together lots of different pieces of the surface of Mars of different ages and different mineralogies. There's a backscattered image up there and our 1.8 gram sample in the bottom left corner, which I'll <laughs> talk about further. So um, Martian meteorites, the background, there's over 100 known now. When I started my PhD, we got to about a total of 80, but they're constantly finding and characterizing more. And there's going to be a speech about them at LPSC in a couple of weeks' time, a big conference in Houston. So traditionally, the Martian meteorites were known as SNCs after three um, witnessed falls, Shagoti in India, Narkla, and Chassigny. And so we get the Shergotites, Narklites, and Chassignites, as you may have heard about before. And these are all um, deeper formed rocks from volcanic processes rather than this new breccia, which we think was formed in an impact. Um, so where does it fit in on the scale of the previous meteorites? Well, the shergotites are all pretty young. They're thought to be under half a billion years old. Um, and the narclites are all of a very similar age, thought to be perhaps one ejection event from Mars, around 1.3 billion. So there's a huge time scale between the 1.3 billion and then right back to 4.4 billion, um, 4.5, where ALH84001, um, that was a controversial meteorite published in 2001. They thought they had found signs of life, but there's other explanations for the processes they found. However, um, this regolith breccia is, um, fits on the scale. The whole rock age is around 2.1 billion years, so it samples a new reference point in the Martian time frame. Also, different materials within this meteorite, they've found zircons, which are 4.4 billion years old, and there's a whole range of argon dating ages published um, between about 1.3 and 1.8, and it's thought that sort of um, the elements of this rock had reset in, in perhaps the event that formed the meteorite, so perhaps it was formed at 1.3, but the precursor materials were up to 4.4 billion years in age. So it gives us a whole new sample um, reference. So um, why is this important? So being formed of the regolith on Mars, it's our first opportunity to sample materials at an impact crater other than on Earth or the Moon. And um, obviously impact cratering is a very important process throughout the solar system. We use it to age other surfaces. Um, and this is our first sample. Um, it's known to be the most hydrated and oxidised out of the Martian meteorites. So there's many things to look into. It's thought to have formed in some sort of ejector blanket of a large impact event. Um, possibly it was subject to a hydrothermal system. So we set out to look at the thermal history and alteration history within this meteorite. Um, so when you think of craters, you may traditionally think of meteor crater out in Arizona on the bottom, a 1.2 kilometer crater. Um, the Montaraki is in Chile, um, the top picture there. But really we're talking about um, things on a much grander scale. If you've ever been to the Reese crater in Germany, um, this was thought to be 24 kilometers in diameter, the original impact. Um, and it's diagnosed now, um, it's not a traditional bowl-shaped crater like um, the uh, well-preserved ones, um, but it features like these shatter cones um, and breccia are you know, the distinguishing characteristics of a crater event. So this compares on Mars. Um, we've seen many craters in the um, high-rise imagery and so on. This is from Stuart Turner in our group. Um, he, oops, sorry. He um, characterised this crater, and um, you can see rings of fluidised ejector material. So it's thought that with an impact of this sort of force, um, you can get flow-like features. Um, and the processes are not well understood um, in the detail. Um, but hydrated minerals have been found here, and it's thought that some sort of hydrothermal um, hydrothermal system operated after the impact event, which um, mobilised water in the crust and created um, hydrated minerals. So we're wondering if we've got signs of this in our meteorite. There's also various textual um, 
features of interest. Um, the left two images are of a CT scan we took all the way through the sample. And this circle of um, accreted material um, around different layers, sort of a central pellet and then a dusty rim, have been seen in several other samples of the meteorite. This one was published by Whitman, and this one's a recent one in another abstract. And these are features um, which uh, we're wondering how they form. They're similar to things you see in pyroclastic events, explosive volcanism. Um, and indeed, they're think similar to features seen in the Reese Crater and Sudbury ba Impact Basin. So these accretionary lapilli, again, you've got the circles and the dusty rims. Um, that's out of a 1981 paper, so the imagery is improved here in the Sudbury one. And you have these pellets, um, which may be airborne in some big impact plume column, um, perhaps mobilised by water in an atmosphere, and, well, certainly on Earth, and this could make dusty rims stick to it. But how does this process operate on Mars? Is it similar or different? There's also been work done by Mike Branny on comparing the stack fadder impact deposits um, with um, Tenerife pyroclastic deposits. So you've got accretionary lapilli from an impact event and from a volcanic event here, and you've got pellets from the same event there and there. So there's a lot of similarity between these processes. So if um, a, in a pyroclastic and explosive volcanism, you can have a big plume form um, and lots of fallout material, but you can also have devastating pyroclastic density currents and flows. Um, and we're thinking the same things can happen in an impact event. We know there can be impact plumes and fallout material, but there can also be flows. So we're looking at the textures to try and distinguish and see if these processes have happened on Mars. Um, people think I go on holiday too much. So I went to Tenerife in December, and we spent six hours at this um, outcrop on a um, road cut. But it's amazing the amount of detail in all the layers in here. For example, um, the blue and yellow mark a fallout layer of pellets, which we looked at. Um, and I collected some samples, which we can potentially use in um, an ongoing study I'm doing at the moment. <coughs> so the bulk of my work to date um, has been focusing more on looking into this with electron microscopy and X-ray spectroscopy techniques. So we're going from uh, looking at very tiny materials with very big machines. So as I said, we have a 1.8 gram sample out of which we've made three sections. And basically the bulk of my PhD work has just been on these three tiny sections. And the one millimeter scale bar applies here. Um, and then with the scanning electron microscope, we can get down to this sort of 50 micron scale. So we're at thousandths of a millimeter already. And then with a transmission electron microscope, we can get all the way down to 100 nanometers <coughs> and further. So we can really look in detail at what's going on because you can see from the backscattered image here, there's a very fine-grained matrix to try and analyze a specific point without hitting several different phases at once. You need a very um, focused beam size, which is why we do a lot of work at the Diamond Synchrotron. Um, we've had four beam time sessions in my PhD time so far um, where we can do X-ray absorption spectroscopy. This helps us compare the iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus, which shows us how oxidized the mineral is, which is quite important. Um, and X-ray diffraction allows us to precisely determine um, what mineral we have. So with the iron oxides, there's a whole range of hydrated oxides which we can't tell apart um, with the electron microscopy techniques otherwise. And we also use another beamline, B22. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy basically allows us to look for the hydration and the water content. So again, we know this um, meteorite's well hydrated, but is it in the pyroxenes or the feldspars or the iron oxides? Whereabouts is the water hosted and why and how did it get there? So um, I'll take you through a few clasps. Um, so this is one of the pyroxene clasps. You'll notice the stripy X solution texture. Um, that's basically because it's um, this class, when it first formed, it cooled very slowly and the calcium separated. So you have calcium rich parts and calcium poor parts. Um, another class here is a low calcium pyroxene. So these are just silicate minerals. Um, the little white flecks in this class are important, we think. Um, the little flecks of iron oxide, and we see this in some of the pyroxene clasps, as if there's a slight breakdown of texture going on. And we looked at this further um, at higher resolution, which I'll show you in a few minutes. There's also a feldspar border um, showing some sort of evidence of remelting or recrystallization <sighs> at some stage. And here there's another X solution class, but it's a very fine one. You may struggle to see it. Um, there's some vertical lines running through there, again, of the calcium-rich and poor separation. And um, 
So by analysing the composition of the calcium-rich parts and the calcium-poor parts, you can plot them on a compositional plot like this. So we're looking between a magnesium-rich end member, iron-rich, and calcium-rich at the top. And by plotting the two compositions and using thermometry techniques um, from Lindsley's paper in the 70s, you can get an approximate temperature at which these crystallise. So we've got an idea that these um, ex-solution class crystallise at around 900 degrees C. Um, so the transmission lecture on microscopy, um, for this we took two samples out of our thin sections. So um, we're already one millimetre across and then we carved out two tiny little samples from these bits, um, which is shown in more detail here. In fact, sorry, I'll just point out the area here you'll see is this light grey. It looks quite homogenous at this scale. It looks like you've got one material. But when we go into a higher resolution, you start seeing the little flecks of iron oxide appear again. And at the transmission electron microscope resolution, the black grains are iron oxide. And you see you have a very heterogeneous sample where you thought you had just one material. Um, and these images show how we've got pyroxene, but it looks like it's separating out into iron oxide and this amorphous aluminium silicate material, which we sort of see in between. And this is unusual because pyroxene is quite stable, and it suggests it's a high temperature sort of breakdown um, that we don't really see very often. Um, in fact, I've been struggling to find analogues in the literature of, of why this would occur. So to look into this a bit further and look at the oxidation of this region, um, we did some X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So um, in the middle here, um, this orange map, the dark areas show you the more iron 3 plus parts, and the light areas show you the iron 2 plus. Um, the X-ray fluorescence map on the left here just shows you the minerals present. So red, you see the iron is present pretty much all the way through the section. You've got a bit of calcium mixing in here. Um, but it shows you there's basically oxidation sort of everywhere because there's not very much dark area. And you can quantify this. Every single pixel on that map you can plot as a graph and see exactly where the energy level is, which shows you um, how shifted and how much iron oxide you have. So we did exactly the same thing on this basaltic class. As you see, you've got the iron oxide grains throughout it again, um, in the middle of this pyroxene material often. Um, and so we did a Zanes map right across this big white box. Oh, sorry, I was first going to show you. Um, this, this shows you the mineralogy. Um, so you've got iron at the red points, calcium at the light green. The dark green is a combination of the two, showing you the pyroxenes. And the aluminium really maps the feldspar rich areas. Um, so there's a lot going on in this um, particular class. Also, this red we'll come back to in a minute because we've identified this to be a hydrated iron oxide mineral. Um, so looking at the oxidation of this area, um, you'll see at the top again you've got um, very heavy oxidation right over this class. So this class is basically completely oxidised. And these are a proportion of iron 2 plus, iron 3 plus again. So... Um, and so, as I said, you can plot all of these as graphs, and by looking at the small changes in the energy and in these absorption peaks, you can see the green and pink are shifted right of the blue, um, the blue being a reference class which didn't show any of these features. It didn't show the breakdown in, to iron oxide or anything like that. So um, using calibration scale from Leon's paper, um, we came up with a figure of about 25% iron 3 plus in these particular areas, which appeared to be altered. Um, so to check this reaction and see um, why it had occurred, we wondered if water had been involved in this breakdown and alteration. So um, we did some analysis on the FTIR beamline. Um, and while we saw some hydration in the Gertite class, so, and we saw hydration in our standards, so we know that it was working, we didn't really see any hydration at all in that basaltic class or the pigeonite class. So um, we think this um, reaction, whatever oxidised it, must have been at high temperature, um, and uh, anhydrous. So looking through the literature, um, we've come across this paper about peroxine smelting in uralites, um, another type of meteorite entirely. But they've got very similar textures to us with this iron breakdown. Um, now, uralites have had a completely different history to Martian meteorites, um, and it, um, their reactions would have happened in a more reducing environment. So they have actual metallic iron rather than our iron oxide. But it's a very similar sort of texture that they've got this pitted porous sort of iron oxide. So we're comparing ours to theirs, and they, they think that this oxidation of peroxine came about by the impact event itself. So um, where we've got this, um, as you see, it's in quite a few classes, the one I showed you already. Um, we're looking at this in more detail to see how this worked. 
Um, so coming back to this basaltic clast, um, as I said, this area of it is known to be an iron oxide, and it's very, um, very oxidised. And we discovered it was... Um, we did some SEM mapping, and this shows you there's a few other trace elements in there. There's a bit of sulphur, a um, bit of titanium. Um, two of the key things here are these veins um, running down here and across here. And you'll see from the map that they've got calcium in them. Um, these are probably terrestrial veins from weathering in the desert when it fell on Earth. But because they cross-cut the other material, we think, um, we, we're hoping that the iron oxide turned out to be formed on Mars, because you can never rule out terrestrial weathering. At the moment, we've sent this section to Australia to be analysed um, with the DH ratios, so um, the heavy hydrogen to the lighter hydrogen, which has a different ratio in the Martian atmosphere. So if the goethite formed on Mars, we should be able to... Um, know for sure once we've got the results of that. So we also did an X-ray fluorescence map. Um, we've got the iron in red. We've got a reasonably heavy trace of nickel throughout this, which implies it's been changed by impact to material because nickel's a signature of the, one of the chondrites um, involved in one of the impacts that this material's experienced. Um, and so we did X-ray diffraction in a whole map across this box region here. So I have about 56 data points. I've just plotted two of them up here in red at the bottom. And you'll see the X-ray peaks match quite closely with the blue line, the goethite, um, and the black lines guide you visually um, to show we have a really good match for identifying goethite. Um, now, goethite's an orthorhombic mineral, so... Um, to prove this, because you could have different peaks fitting and there can be complications. To sit, so to see how good your fit is, you can compare um, from your data, you can calculate the unit cell size, um, the ABC dimensions. And we had a pretty good fit um, from the database, the reference materials for Goethite are in, plotted in grey and black, and my data is plotted in red. So as you can see, the parameters fit very closely, and they didn't fit at all for the other iron oxides that people have been suggesting could be in this meteorite. Um, we also did the X-ray absorption on this. Again, um, there's a lot of similarity with other, other iron oxides, so you can't absolutely say if it's goethite from this, but the results support it. Um, so how did goethite form on Mars? Um, there's a couple of main reactions that could, could have taken place from magnetite or magimite, which we know um, exist in the meteorite. Um, it could also form from pyrite, um, which is also another theory put forward. And as you can see from the equations, um, you can transform magnetite into a goethite via these steps. This reaction would happen at low temperature um, under alkaline conditions. So if it happened on Mars, this suggests that we had low temperature water rock reactions going on. Um, so to sort of put this all together, the story so far, um, there's the precursor material, there's ancient ages in the meteorite, um, there's this impact formation event. A lot of people are pointing the finger towards the sort of 1.3 to 1.8 billion years ago. Um, this impact event happened where we've got high temperature veins and sort of melting at the edge of some clasts. We've got this breakdown of the um, pyroxene, which is very unusual, at an high, just high temperature reaction. But then we also have these low temperature late reactions, which could have happened late in its history on Mars or possibly in the terrestrial desert on Earth. Um, there's quite a lot of different literature coming out on this meteorite all the time. There's seven different pairs of this meteorite, so quite a lot of different labs around the world have got samples to work on, and everybody's seeing different things to some extent, so the, the story's gradually becoming clearer um, as we go on. Um, now, before I finish up, I've got quite a round of thank yous, and not only to my collaborators at Leicester, but to Ian Crawford for inviting me to speak here today and for nominating me to RAS Council, and to everyone who elected me to RAS Council because I finished my term today, and I'm very grateful for that experience and for learning so much about the society. And also this picture I took on my trip to Chile last year, which I won in a social media competition, again, thanks to many people that kindly supported me from the astronomy community. So with that, I will finish. Thank you very much, Jane. So, any comments or questions? Let, let the very, probably naive question, but you said there are now about 100 identified Martian meteorites. Um, are, are they still confirmed by the analysis of the trapped gas or...? 
Um, so it's mainly oxygen isotope ratios they look at now. Because, um, so the heavy oxygen to light oxygen, um, all rocks on Earth plot on one line, um, whereas all rocks on Mars tend to plot on another line. There's a slight anomaly in the oxygen isotopes on this meteorite, as it happens that they're even higher than the normal Martian values, but, but they're closer to that than anything else. So the community is satisfied this one's from Mars. And, and that's now the standard uh, Yeah, the oxygen test. isotopes are the easiest. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jane, you mentioned that um, the possibility that the iron oxides could have been terrestrial. So I wonder if you could comment in general about how weathered this sample is. Um, so we think we've got some relatively fresh fusion crust, though someone else informed that kind of none of the, the, these stretches actually have fusion crust and it's more desert varnish. So it's difficult to know. But we don't see sort of abundant calcium calcium carbonates or anything, um, so we don't see big signs of it. Uh, another group think that um, there was alteration to pyrite, which happened on Mars, and alteration to goethite <laughs> happened on Earth, and in their sample, um, they've done the DH ratios, and they've proved their goethite was on Earth, but as it, in a bit of a different context to theirs, and the water's got to be somewhere. We know there's a high level of water, and the original isotope analysis shows that there is a strong um, Martian ratio in the water as well. So even, even if half the water might be terrestrial, at least half of it must be Martian and it must be somewhere in this rock. In. Uh, and you, to Joe, did I understand correctly that your um, ejection age from Mars, did you say that was like 1.3 billion years ago? Or? No, no uh, sorry, um, I said that for the NARC lights probably. Um, for, for this meteorite, um, it's got a cosmic ray exposure age of about 5 million. So they think it travelled in space for about 5 million before it landed on Earth, but they don't really know how long it sat on Earth for. I think it's secure because the other compositional data and everything else fits what we know from Mars and what we know from the rovers and other things. As far as other surfaces go, I'm <coughs> not entirely sure. There might be people that can answer that better than me, perhaps Sarah at the back. But there is, there is other evidence on the, on the issue, not just that isotope ratio. And, yeah. Well, the other evidence being um, all, all of the rest of the compositions found in the meteorite matching compositions we're sort of seeing from the rover data and so forth. Sarah, have a Sarah do you want to come in? We have loads of um, pieces of different bodies of the solar system on the form of meteorites on Earth, mm. and each family has its own... Oh, sorry. Shall I say that again? Okay. <laughs> we, we've got examples of many different planetary bodies on Earth in the form of meteorites, and uh, each family has a distinctive isotope composition. You can't jump from one of these to another by mass fractionation. It's a mass-independent effect, which suggests they're from different bodies. And um, yeah, so I think it, it's our best guess that these these objects are from Mars. When you say many different bodies, yeah, can you? Well, expand? mostly asteroids. Yeah, so we don't have many. We only the only other planet we have is is uh, are the, these bits of Martian meteorite, but we have bits of the Moon as well, and we have. Um, I should have bought my meteorite hundreds of different tasks of different yeah, asteroids. You've got sort of the L meteorites, the H, the double Ls, the enstatite chondrites, and basically each of those groupings is kind of quite a big sheet now with about twenty or thirty different groups, and they're all known to sort of have similar characters to each other, characteristics to each other, and different ones to the other sets. And, and is it still correct that you could just about get get a piece of Venus to, to, to the Earth? Ju just about? The escape but velocities would be pretty hard, I think, but maybe it's not beyond all question. We're hoping for one for Mercury to turn up. We kind of, I, I think Mercury probably has a slightly better yeah, chance, but, yeah. but of course things are more likely to chip into the Sun as things, Jupiter spikes things from the asteroid belt in towards the inner solar system, so they're more likely to go the wrong way from Mercury. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, I refer to these uh, structures called ovoids, and 
these are kind of small marble-like beads discovered in, well, they were reported in 2014, and they made big news worldwide. Um, I wonder if you discovered or saw any narcla, is it narcla meteorite? I think they were discovered in mar uh, nar uh, narcla. In the narclite. I haven't done any direct work on the narclites myself. My group have been, Leon and John do a lot of work on the narclites, but I, I think if they'd found any, they'd be publishing about it if it was <laughs> definitely confirmed. They have been discovered, actually. They were reported, as I said, in 2014. They really did make them right. big news. Well, I, I don't think they've found any more of their own, otherwise... Yeah. They're, 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 Thanks. They're... Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Jane. Thank you.